Podcast. I'm your host, Sal. And Luke, of course, is joining me to discuss more rather unpleasant topics this evening, I suppose, but very important ones for everybody's consideration. So, how's it going, Luke? Pretty good. Yeah, so... I just got my kid down to sleep, so we're ready to record a podcast. Are you ready to talk all about uh, crime and uh, other issues that we face as a nation? Increases in crime and uh, how nobody's coming to save you. Hey, hey, so yes, that's pretty I'm, much I'm the gist. Up. That might be the yes, title that, of this that episode. Tends to sum, <laughs> sum it up. So, in this episode, we will actually delve into uh, some of the particulars about this. So, this is rather timely. In fact, I know that I've done several articles in the past few months on USA Carry about basically the lawlessness that is happening, specifically in larger urban areas the greatly reduced police reaction time that we're seeing. And these are serious considerations for the prepared citizen. You know, if you are an armed citizen, which we hope you are, you have to factor these things into your own your own personal protection plan, your own family protection plan. Uh, it's just a new era. So if we look at crime itself, and I know, Luke, you have some good stats on this kind of stuff as well, so feel free to jump in whenever you want. Yeah, we'll put want. some of that stuff in the show notes as well for everybody. So Absolutely, absolutely. Before we get into it, this show is sponsored by Filster Holsters. If you've listened to our show before, you've heard us talking about them. They're one of the top holster manufacturers in the industry. Filster differentiates themselves by bringing innovation to their holster designs and systems instead of just making the same thing everyone else is making. You'll hear us talking about their holster system, the Filster Enigma, a lot because that's what I'm carrying with 90% of the time. So go and check them out at filsterholsters.com. So th the bottom line is that in the past several years, we've had an uptick in specifically violent crime, although if you look at a lot of other forms of crime as well, theft, et cetera, is up significantly. Mm -hmm. It has a lot to do with where you're, you know, it, it's hard to paint with a broad brush nationwide, although, yes, statistics are generally higher nationwide. Obviously, certain areas are much more affected. You know, as an example, I here in the central Atlantic seaboard area, Baltimore and Washington, D.C. have both had very bad years the past two years, uh, 2021, uh, I'm sorry, 22 and 23, uh, very high homicide rate again. It's climbed back up. So essentially from the early 90s, the actually the most violent year on record for the United States was 1993. And we've okay. been in a fairly steady decline every year up until about 2019. It was with little bumps along the way, et cetera. Uh, then, of course, in 2020, the bottom fell out. And I suppose people realize the primary reasons for that, we had the COVID-19 lockdowns mm -hmm. and then the summer love, basically, right? The George Floyd protest in a lot of big cities. So we've had an increase, a significant bump in 2020, but um, certain forms of violent crime have remained high now for the past several years. So people need to, to realize that. And as far as big events that foster these kind of upticks in crime. We, we've we actually seen a lot of these in our lifetime. I know, Luke, at least in, in our lifetime, now that we're not exactly spring chickens anymore, right. we can think of a number of things. For example, think of the L.A. riots, which mm -hmm. I believe were 91, 92, I think 92. Sounds about um, right. What we saw with the L.A. riots was, and, and you can go back to the 60s. And, 92. You know, of course, yeah, Maybe. 92, okay. So the L.A. riots, you know, 63 people died in that. Mm -hmm. And what was interesting about that situation was the unrest kicked off, of course, following a particularly brutal occurrence of police brutality now there's the argument that says that you know the footage only showed what was happening right at the end okay uh, essentially though the the footage shows you know police wailing on uh, a guy named rodney king right mm -hmm. that was rodney king yeah I, and uh, the city explodes into rage the bigger problem though was that the law enforcement response in the la riots was they essentially just pulled back and let everything go frenzy, right? 
And that is kind of a precedent that we've seen now over and over again, all these mm-hmm. years later, is that when, when, when things happen in the wake of some event, that there's this scenario of law enforcement and the powers that be in big cities just letting things run wild, you know, and it, it, it absolutely emboldens a criminal element. So it's nothing particular. Uh, the the really, uh, we're going to get into some issues with, with police recruitment, police numbers being low, police morale being low, and this is really, really the big problem. Uh, when it, as it factors into an increase in, in violent crimes. And this scenario is actually not just new to 2020. I, I want people to realize that starting in 2014 or 2015, when was Ferguson, the Michael Brown killing in Ferguson, uh, we saw the start of what has been referred to as the Ferguson effect. 2014. August okay, 9th. 2014. So... In that event, and I'm sure many people listening are familiar with with the killing of Michael Brown, okay? So a police officer killed an 18-year-old, uh, you know, kid. I, I refer to anyone as 18 as being a kid, although technically yeah. and legally they're an adult, right? I mean, we're uh, both over 40, so... I, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're definitely kids, uh, in our opinion. So anyway... Um, the immediate media narrative was that this was an unjust, racially fueled slaying of an 18 year old, right? A teenager. And then later on, over the weeks following the events, the facts come out that this kid committed a strong armed robbery. He was an enormous guy, right? Big, powerful guy. Mm-hmm. He committed a strong armed robbery literally within an hour or two of the cop actually stopping him on the street. And then he assaulted the cop and tried to take the cop's gun, right? And he got right. shot for his efforts and died. So in the wake of that, we have a massive protest, which, again, the narrative that goes out at the beginning was, hey, 18-year-old killed, he was unarmed, etc. People go wild, there's massive protests, etc. But since then, we've experienced what is referred to as the Ferguson effect. Many mm-hmm. media places will argue that this is a myth. I, I think the statistics clearly show that it's not a myth. Okay, right. police become more and more afraid to actually do their job because they know that they're going to be thrown right under the bus even if they do the right thing. And we see that coming out of the Ferguson events. And then, of course, in 2020, not only is everybody at home during lockdowns and everybody's going crazy as it is that summer, then we have the George Floyd incident. Right. which is absolutely a much more sinister incident. I think everybody would, would agree with that. You know, that, mm-hmm. that cop, what he did is at best exceedingly negligent and at worst murder, you know, is somewhere probably mm-hmm. in between. But <clears throat> once again, we have a social movement that seeks to defund police and cripple police based on the actions of one bad cop, one bad cop in a country of 340 million people. It's, it's absolutely absurd, you know. Right. Uh, but we're living now in the fallout of that, of the Ferguson effect, and now the the even stronger George Floyd effect. So I just wanted to set that up for people because we'll delve into this a little bit here. That the greatest reason for the increase in crime in large urban areas is that the police force is simply not enforcing the law the way they have done in the past. You combine that with the fact that many prosecutors have an agenda, a political agenda that involves letting out repeat offenders, not prosecuting crimes unless they are exceedingly serious. And the result is more and more criminals on the streets, less and less proactive policing among law enforcement. Right. You've got all the shoplifting that's going on, just like rampant everywhere. Uh, 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 and they're not, you know, not you know, and, and again, it, it, certain cities are, are different, right? You have, for example, um, at least it was publicized this way that essentially San Francisco, they they were mm-hmm. not prosecuting theft for under $950. From what I've read, that's not exactly the case. You know, right. uh, that's not actually was the, the decree that, oh, if it's less than $950, we're not prosecuting. It was a little more complicated than that. But generally, what you had going on in San Francisco, as well as many other big cities, is prosecutors who are absolutely not prosecuting criminals 
unless they're really forced to live. It's, you know, very violent crime or something like that. So it's just resulted in the increase in madness that we see. It's yeah. making sense so far? Yeah, for sure. Okay, so, you know, before we talk about how, the ramifications of this, obviously for the armed citizen, just to give a few examples, and I know you've pulled up some information on this as well, Luke, but mm -hmm. to, to give a few examples to people of the crisis that our current law enforcement throughout the country is in, again, it's really very city-specific. You know, there's certain places where it's really not an issue, but there's many big cities now where this is a real issue. That is the retention of officers, the recruitment of new officers, and finally just, you know, officers actually doing what they should be doing or playing right. it as safe as possible and no longer uh, proactively policing, right? Here's just a few examples. Um, Well-known firearms instructor John Farnham, he actually uh, pointed out this information from the city of Pittsburgh. The Pittsburgh PD uh, in 2019 and before had over 1,700 sworn officers, and those ranks have fallen to 800 now. You know, there's there's an, an example of, of a city that's really been hammered by this phenomenon. If you look at the NYPD, so that's New York City Police Department, which, of course, is, is the, you know, largest police force in the country. Um, you know, the NYPD has more manpower than a lot of standing armies in the world. You know, people <laughs> right. don't realize that, you know, just, just the, the sheer magnitude, the number of the ranks. Uh, anyway, though, if you look at New York City Police Department, if you look at the testing, the initial exams that that hopeful recruits take, in 2017, they had 18,463 people actually took the entrance exams. Mm -hmm. Compare that to 2022, that's the newest stats I could find on it, only 6,489 took the exams. So you, have you know that's stats almost, on how many people passed? Yeah, that's that's not even that's only people who just took the initial took the exam. exam. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. So the the point of that is that just your interest in e even joining the force is down to one third of what it was right. in twenty seventeen. You know, yeah, so I mean, we're I wouldn't want to be a cop right now. Yeah, um, absolutely. And <laughs> anybody who's, you know, been paying attention to what's going on must be thinking the same thing. Yeah, you know, I was. So, yeah, I live outside of New Orleans, and I've found some stats. Uh, two twenty-three, they had a net loss of over a hundred officers, and so far, whenever this was published um, in twenty-four, they've added seventy recruits and lost fifty-one officers. So they're trying to rebuild to a to a staff level of twelve hundred officers. Enough. So, Enough. Yeah, and it's not looking good. No, not at all. And that, and, but that seems nowhere near as bad as some of the other cities that we're seeing, you know. Right. So uh, a lot of that's going to have to do with the leadership in the city, right? What uh, are these uh, police officers working for a department that has their back or is quick to throw them under the bus for anything that's politically charged? Right. You know, so uh, it's, it's, a, it's a serious issue. Um, early retirement is at an all-time high across almost the entire nation for for um, officers, and the recruitment is down significantly everywhere. Again, certain places more so than others. New York City, Pittsburgh, perfect examples of that. Okay. Right. So we combine that with now a real turn away from active policing. So what was initially dubbed, and I think this started in New York, they, they, came up with this term of the broken windows policy, right? Where, in other words, if, if you are arresting people for low-level crime, then it reduces high-level crime. You know, they don't do that anymore. As an example, in New York City years ago, um, you know, late 90s, early 2000s, when crime was really decreasing rapidly, they were arresting people who jumped the turnstiles in the subway, right? Okay, they don't right. do that anymore. Look what the subway's like now, just in the past few years. In fact, there was just, uh, I was just reading today, I should have grabbed it. But anyway, uh, you know, today's day is uh, the 15th of March. For anybody interested, just look up, you know, New York subway, March 15th, mm -hmm. and you'll see the incident that just happened in the past day or two of a fight broke out on the subway. One guy pulled a gun. 
The guy he pulled it on ended up shooting him with his own gun. And it's, you know, it's just this kind of insanity. And in fact, that exact article was talking about how the New York City has deployed National Guard members to the subways. So yeah. that's the situation we're at. So if you don't want to proactively police, you don't want to arrest people for low-level crimes, you end up with, you know, thugs roaming the streets. It's that simple. And if we want to put, you know, political agendas ahead of public safety, this is how we end up. And and this is where we are. So we are all facing a reality that's very different than what we've had since really the late 90s. You know, it's been the past few years is the first significant uptick in violent crime that we've had since the early 1990s. Right. So we've got all these stats. What's that mean? What's that boil down to? I mean, what, when as you call nine one, nobody's coming. For you. Just, nobody's yeah, coming to help. Uh, exactly I mean. right. Exactly <laughs> right. And and this is this is where it gets real for the individual, right? So we look at the stats. Okay, recruitment is down, uh, morale is down, et cetera, et cetera. Well, what's the bottom line of that? What does it mean to you as the individual? That is exactly right. Okay, nine one one, nobody is coming, and. This may sound dramatic, and again, it's going to depend on where you are, right? There's a lot of, especially smaller town, rural areas, are nowhere near as impacted by right. this, okay? I just as did an article recently, areas. and I think it was an elderly woman somewhere in Idaho, and the cops were there in like three minutes or something, if I remember correctly. It was last week or the week before, so awesome. Yeah, but absolutely. It was and in the middle know, of I'm sure there's places in Idaho, Idaho. Just, just because of where you are, the, the your closest response is probably six hours away, right? Uh, <laughs> right. But, yeah, that's amazing right. for Idaho. But, you know, there's a lot of areas that are not uh, as affected by this, obviously. Mm -hmm. But, you know, think of a place like Pittsburgh. Oh, what I forgot to mention about Pittsburgh is the city actually put out an announcement that they will not be responding to nonviolent emergencies Right. between the hours of whatever and whatever. I forget what it was. So, you know, there's an example of you can call 911 depending on where you live. There very well may be nobody coming. Oh I'm like, I knew I, that sounded familiar, and I'm like, was that in an article you wrote? It's from 3 to 7 a.m. It's right here, yeah. 3 so, to 7 a.m. No call. They won't respond to calls involving theft, harassment, criminal mischief, burglary, et cetera, from 3 to 7 a.m. Yeah, so if somebody's stealing your car, don't bother calling. Between no. those times, nobody's coming. Anyway, you know, not that they'd ever be there in time anyway, but, uh, right. and, and, you know, we circle back to that. Now, one thing we've talked about extensively, Luke, of course, is that you're your own first responder. You know, you can live in the city with the most proactive police department still out there. And mm -hmm. the old saying, when seconds count, the police are minutes away, right? So right. that should that should be the game plan all along. There's nothing that particularly changes that. However, the fact that you may get an exceedingly delayed response or even no response at all does change the game plan because mm -hmm. now you are not only on your own in those seconds when it counts, but you may be on your own for a very extended period. Another thing I would mention, Luke, is you know EMTs, paramedics, are not going to come into a dangerous crime scene that's not been cleared by the police, right. right? So if you have injured people to deal with, these are things to to think about that you may not have any kind of response for hours, even in the wake of a violent encounter. Right. Right. Yeah, so, but I had to call the police. It was a couple months ago, and it was just kids kicking the front door, like ring the doorbell and run, but we didn't know that. I was in Las Vegas with my girlfriend. They were kicking the front door, two of them ran upstairs, got her upstairs. She called the police. I had my gun. We looked at the ring doorbell, realized it was probably just kids. But we still called the police, let them know. We sat around. I think maybe an hour or so later, we got another call from like a supervisor, said they're going to send somebody out. Maybe another hour after that, somebody came out, knocked on the door. So again, it was just kids. So if it had been more serious, maybe they would have been quicker but still like but and they found out it they talked to another neighbor their door got kicked in too and so it was just kids but you know sitting around for two hours before somebody showed right. up right right and 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 again even if 
it was a more violent thing and the response was faster. How much faster is it going to be? What are it wouldn't have been fast enough to That's, save us. If, if yeah. they were coming through the door, obviously not fast enough. So yeah. Maybe and, think a lot like, where's my gun when yep. we're sitting on the couch and somebody kicks that front door in? You know, it Who's? wasn't right here. It wasn't on me and it wasn't on the coffee table, but it is now. Uh, right. You know? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. You experience something like that, and it's just a reminder of how quickly mm -hmm. things can happen. You get you know? and I, sometimes, and you got a, you know, a good reminder. Yes, no question. I, I remind people of the irony that, remember the people who tell you you don't need a gun because that's the police's jobs? They're also they the ones bodyguards. who want it. Yeah, they're also the ones, that's <laughs> right, generally will have their own private security in their gated neighborhoods. They're also the ones who are pushing for, you know, defunding the police and crippling the police. Right. Isn't, so isn't that interesting? Don't have a gun to protect yourself and then no police <laughs> to protect you. To yeah, protect exactly. You. Yeah. Which that's uh, not it's their amazing. job anyway. Right. So. Yeah, it's amazing. So that's the kind of absurdity that, that we're up against. But, you know, this is this is a very real thing. So uh, just an anecdotal experience of my own. Uh, three or four months ago, I I called the police, you know, not emergency line. It wasn't an emergency. Just because um, in my cul-de-sac, uh, there's uh, a strip of woods in, uh, in the back. And uh, this has been a number of times now, a group of guys getting rowdy, just sitting around, um, drinking. Now, okay. it's right on the outskirts of a county park, so they're not supposed to be drinking there anyway, and they're actually on the neighborhood property, not even in the park. So they're on private property. You know, mm -hmm. call, no response ever came at all. They said they'd send somebody by, nobody showed up at all, and that right. is just, you know, a perfect example. That kind of stuff, forget it. You're getting so you no grabbed response. your gun and handled it yourself, right? Oh yeah, you know I yeah. I went out there and uh, you know uh, of course yeah sure I uh, you know Which you I'm guys sure you know drink, we'll we'll get you guys comments on private property yeah, yeah I was uh, I I suppose I should have dug the graves first right and you right. know to, yeah so I'm sure we'll get all kinds of comments about how I should have gone out there and started something but right like all the articles <laughs> where you know somebody is breaking into somebody's car and they go out to investigate sometimes it works out great for them sometimes it doesn't and we say like you know it's not worth going out there and trying to protect your car that has insurance and then you get comments like well what are we supposed to do let them do it well I'm not dying over my car yeah, so. I'm not dying or going to prison over my car and I'm sure not right. dying or going to prison over some dudes out drinking in the, you know, in, in the woods, uh, right. behind the house, you know, it, it's just, it, it, it's absurd. And, you know, I, I understand that. And especially if you live in a really rural place, I, I would respect that more. You know, if I was living in some of the places I've lived in the, in the past, you mm -hmm. know, where I am, you know, six miles down a dirt road, you know, 300 acres, then you're going to deal with things yourself. There's no question about that, you know, right. but you have to consider the environment and the circumstances. In suburbia, why would you leave your house to go get involved in something that then could turn deadly and you end up dead or somebody else ends up dead and now your life is ruined for an ordeal that you are inevitably going to go through uh, in the justice system, right? Right. They come into your home, that's a whole different thing, right? In mm -hmm. fact, uh, I did an article in the past few months called The Door. I think it was called A Physical and Legal Protection or something, something like that. Something about the front uh, door. It'll be in the comments. Or yeah. It'll be in yes. the show notes, everybody. So, you know, that that addresses exactly this. If you stay in your house, you stack the deck so greatly in your favor, both tactically and legally. You, mm -hmm. The difference legally between if you have to use force in your house compared to anywhere outside of it is enormous. I don't think people realize that. So stay in your house. L yeah. Let managing, the trouble come to you. Managing violence at your front door. Mm, that was a, another thing about the door. I, I, uh, that was a, a different articles article. About, about, yeah, <laughs> yeah, about the door. Yeah. Um, right. No, this one was something about uh, not going outside. Basically, gotcha. you know, if, if yeah. there's problems, Answering so we can find that. that one. Anyway, yeah. we'll find it and put it in the comments. No, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, just just things to consider. But the bottom line here is you may not get a response at all, and it certainly mm -hmm. will not be on time. Uh, the well-known self-defense attorney, Andrew Branca, he's got a great podcast. I recommend everybody tune into his show. It's really excellent. Um, he covers a lot of 
current goings on legally, you know, different legal, legal cases. cases. Yeah, exactly right. Uh, there's one from a couple months ago where he actually played the 911 audio of two different women, two different cities. Um, uh, one I want to say was actually uh, a more rural area, uh, okay. but they called while there was an active home invasion going on. One woman didn't even know who this individual was. One, I believe, if I recall, it was a violent ex. And okay. both calls, the dispatcher told them, we're sorry, we have no one to send you. We have nobody to send. So that is the yeah. modern reality that we are likely dealing with. There is no responder coming. Do so you remember the outcomes of those? Uh, I don't. I don't. Yeah. I think one of the women was assaulted. One was not, I want to say. Okay. Uh, it was one I remember was was a bad outcome. Um, gotcha. So, you know, just just consider, you know, if, if your home defense plan <laughs> is calling 911. I mean, 10 years ago, oh, I would have been laughing if that's your home defense plan. You know, right. now it's an absolute absurdity. There's no right. nobody coming. All right. So, you know, with that said, let's consider the response of, of other things. You know, Luke, uh, like we, we talk a lot about home defense, you know, ballistically. But mm -hmm. another thing you and I have talked about many times is what's your medical plan, right? right? That is now more critical than ever because I circle back to if it's a crime scene, EMTs are not going to show up if the police have not come to make this scene secure. Sure. So right. you are literally on your own now, potentially for hours, even if you, somebody in your household has sustained injury. Yeah, exactly. I mean, going back to what we talked about on the first episode, you got to know how to stop the bleed, have tourniquets on hand, gauze, all that stuff. Like, you got to know how to do that. I mean, what if it takes them an hour to get there, even if the scene is cleared or whatever? You don't know how long it's going to take. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, you, you have to have the skills to to stop major hemorrhaging while it's happening. And probably something that we we might have to start thinking more realistically about is getting somebody evac yourself to the hospital. You know, okay. do you know how far you are from the hospital? Where is the closest hospital, et cetera? What are the best routes? You know, right. this is something that we really now need to start thinking about more. Because in the wake of any kind of violent incident, if there's no police response, you may have no emergency services responding at all. If you are physically sound and somebody in your household is injured, can you get them in the car and get them to the hospital? Likely a lot faster than any kind right. of response could do so. Right. You know, just just another another thing to 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 think about. You know, unfortunately, as as our society goes to hell in a handbasket here, you know? So, um, yeah, those, those are the, those are the big takeaways. You know, the, the lawlessness is absolutely rampant in certain areas. A uh, good example is Washington, DC past couple of years. We've seen an explosion in carjacking again. That's a crime that was generally much lower, um, in recent years than it was in the past. Uh, mm -hmm. Baltimore has seen a significant increase in, in homicide, but it's not just those two notoriously bad cities. We, we see it in a lot of places. Look at the flash mob activity for, for theft. Right. We've seen that That's a lot in California, right? Right. You know, uh, and again, a state with their ridiculous asinine woke policies where they're not prosecuting people for theft. Well, now you have flash mobs of 100 people show up and, you know, smash out the windows and walk into a a store and steal all of the merchandise. You know, mm -hmm. um, let, let's talk to that, Luke, because, you know, just like we need to have the home defense plan and it needs to change, the home medical plan needs to change. Look, what do you suggest uh, should change as far as our plan when in public? So if, you, if you're in... Uh... Walmart or Walgreens and you see a flash mob come in? Is that yeah, kind of the just the yeah, question? Yeah, what are you what would you do, Luke? Shoot them I'd all. I'd probably try to get the hell out of there. If I saw an exit, I'm not going to take on a flash mob on myself, you know. Yeah, yeah. I might yeah, have to, 16, to protect, 17 rounds to, on me, but 
you're not going to protect Walmart's merchandise with your own life, Luke? No, no, no. I don't think so. Yeah, yeah. You know, all, all joking aside, you know, the, these are the things you want to think about. What we've seen in these flash mobs very often, it's youth. You know, you got teenagers, mm -hmm. you got 13, 14 year olds, you know. Uh, not that it matters if the individual is trying to kill you, but, you know, typically That's a different these story, right? Yeah, this is a different story. But, you know, these flash mobs, they're there to steal stuff. Right. You know, I'm not going to stand there and hold my camera, my phone, and to record it so I can put it on TikTok. You know, that's not what I'm going to do, which yeah. you see, that's why you see a lot of people just sitting yeah, there filming amazing, them. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, when are they going to turn around and attack you for filming them? You don't know what they're going to do. So. No, absolutely. It's it's an extremely unpredictable um, event, these, these flash mm -hmm. mobs, you know. So getting out of there as quickly as possible is what you want to do. E even going to the more absurd and extreme, there's several incidents where we've seen where people have taken it upon themselves to be um, a vigilante and have chased people mm -hmm. who shoplifted out of the store, right? Yeah. Only to end up in significant trouble, be it getting injured themselves mm -hmm. or having to kill somebody or, of course, the legal aftermath following that. I want people to think about that for a minute. Are you going to put your entire future and the future of your loved ones on the line to rescue merchandise being stolen from a big box store that probably supports all of the woke policies that have now made this entire reality? Right. And or tells <laughs> their police or tells their employees, don't stop anybody. If you yes, see that tells happen, their employees, right? don't so stop anybody. You're going to go and try to stop it? Yes, supports all of the policies that have hampered law enforcement and encouraged, you know, uh, the non-prosecution of pro uh, of of um, lower level crime. Okay, all of these CEOs in these big companies, not all of them, but most of them right. are totally on board with this. You're going to put your life on the line to save the merchandise from a store somewhere. Absolutely. No, I'm not going to start a confrontation where then it turns into something bigger to where then I have to use my gun and shoot somebody. Yes. I don't, I don't want to be, I don't want to shoot. I don't want to do that. Like, I don't want to be involved in anything. People like don't that, realize so. how that's a life changing event, even if it all goes exactly right, you know, mm -hmm. uh, physically and legally, you know, it's a life changing event and it's, it, nobody should be cavalier yeah. about this. You, you know, the, um, the, the good <clears throat> Samaritan urge, right. Is, it's hard to even talk about because I know inevitably we get comments about, well, if nobody does anything, then, right, that's why the thugs win and stuff. You have to consider your own safety and, again, mm -hmm. the safety and prosperity of your loved ones over doing the virtuous, chivalrous thing. First of right. all, most people you're doing that for, they don't want it. These big companies don't want it. They're actively supporting all of this junk. Or the you people know, you're saving. I think happen. there was something in... New York recently, um, and somebody I was on the subway. Somebody shot somebody that was attacking a woman, and she even said something like, "He shouldn't have done it." Something along yes. those lines that happened within the past c couple weeks or month or something. Yes, like, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. So chivalry <clears throat> is dead, you know, and <laughs> right. and you know, getting involved even with violence between third parties, if you don't know exactly what's happening, it's not your business. Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, there's right. been many, many events in which somebody intercedes um, in a parking lot or public place. Some guy is beating the life out of a woman and the Good Samaritan puts the guy at gunpoint and holds him for police only to then get sued in civil court by the woman for pointing a gun at her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. That's happened many times. Um, and I hate to say it, sound callous about it, but if I don't know you. I'm sorry. I'm, you know, it, it, it depends. The circumstances are different. Uh, active shooters, right. active killers, Kids, that's totally different. Yeah, that, yeah. you brought or that children. up before on, on like CCX yeah. too. I know we've touched mm -hmm. on that. Kids, yeah. active killers are different yeah, stories. Yeah, that, that's but, totally you different. Know. I'm talking about violence between third parties who are doing something to each other that you don't know who they are. You don't know what's involved. You have to stay out of these things. Um you know, if you see it from the beginning, it might be different. You know, we talk about like the, the this mob violence and stuff. 
you see the flash mob materialize and you start beating someone to death. Well, if you've seen it from the beginning and know that's what's happening, that that's different, you know. Right. If you walk out, though, and see a couple fighting, you, you have no clue what's happening, you know. Um, so the even more absurd is getting involved over property of your own or especially of others. Yeah, you know, I you mean, do not intercede to try to stop shoplifting. Yeah, we I feel like we touch on that almost every week with the news report on somebody trying to stop their car from being stolen or broken mm -hmm. into or something like that. Like it's uh, just not worth it. I don't want to end up on Andrew Blanca's Branca's what uh podcast. <laughs> you no. know, not that way. Maybe no, as a guest, absolutely. but not no, not not him yes, talking about yeah, my court not, case. Not as the subject matter, right? Right. We, uh, we don't want any of our <laughs> listeners to end up there either, you know. So you, you need to think about these things beforehand, though, you know. And we encourage yeah. people all the time. So there's not necessarily anything new as far as being prepared and using common sense, knowing the law, etc. But at this point, in the last few years, these skills and this knowledge is more important than it's ever been. You know, I, something right. I come back to more often than I used to, Luke, is, and I know we've touched on this, is, you know, carrying a significant gun. I am just, you know, I used to be a small revolver guy even when I'm out and about all the time, you know. I still mm -hmm. love my small revolver. That's uh, great around the house walking the dog gun but when i'm in public anymore with the family it's yeah. just that's not what i'm carrying anymore you know it's yeah, we um, touched on that the first episode it's just too easy to carry a a, a gun that has enough round you know whatever you yeah. consider enough um like it's more said, viable like, than my Glock 48 i'm carrying 15 plus one rounds or the the uh the sig 365 xl i'm carrying 12 plus one it's just yeah. easy. Why would for, I want to carry for not much more you know? size or weight than than a J frame right. or something like that? Now again, if, if that's all you're willing to carry, you're way ahead of the curve. Realistically, is it probably enough gun to get you out of anything that you get into? Realistically, probably. But we just see more and more events that I I hesitate to call them outlier events because when they happen over and over again, I don't think they're outliers. When we see the active killer scenarios that play out, when we see the mob violence that plays out with, you know, dozens of people assaulting, robbing things, et cetera, that's just, you know, the, the five shot J frame is not what I would want to be wearing if you're caught in an event like that. You know, just something to think about. Again, if that's all the right. individual is willing to carry. Well, then guess what? You're way better prepared than, you know, 95 percent. Of oh, ninety nine percent of the people walking around any given day, you know. Right. But it, it's a different a day and age. I, I think people need to start considering how the threat has changed, and it's changed in a lot of ways because of this attack on law enforcement, this attack on our society in general. You know, policies that are being pushed that really, you know, celebrate the criminal. I don't know any other way to to put it to protect protect the criminal. And simultaneously go after legitimate self-defenders. We've seen that happen over and over again. You know, so in these big urban areas, you do not want to get involved in something if you don't have to. Because the same prosecutor who will let the thug walk, come down with the weight of the world on you, if you dare to defend yourself in this event. And again, it's not hyperbole. Just look at the incidents we've seen. That guy who owned the bodega in New York City. Mm -hmm. Guy comes in with a knife robs this guy they get into a nice fight and who goes to prison the bodega owner until public outcry was so great that uh that that's horrible da they yeah. have in that city finally how long did know, that take for him oh he I was mean... in there you know i i want to say weeks i don't know right. how long exactly but yeah right. th this is what we're Which dealing is ridiculous with. oh it's 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 outrageous it's it's an outrage but you know what i mean these prosecutors are voted for <laughs> positions this is what people keep voting for. So, you know, <clears throat> it, people in those areas, that's how they vote. So until they stop voting for these kind of uh, prosecutors, you know, this is only going to get worse instead of getting better. Right. Does that make sense? It so any, anything you can think of that we left out there, Luke, for discussion? 
No, I think we covered everything on the notes. Just maybe talking about like, you know, there's still a need for training. So yeah, like you said, knowing your laws and just getting training with your gun, knowing how to use it. Um, yeah, I think we pretty much covered Dude, everything. Absolutely. And, <clears throat> and it's more important now than ever. Knowing the laws is more important now than ever. Getting good training in the use of your weapon and the use of everything else involved with your self-defense is more important than ever. You know, we're in a golden age of, of training. There's a lot of good mm -hmm. instructors out there who specialize in a lot of different things. You know, it's not just all old school right. gun guys. So I you go know, back to the, you know, you know, going after the person that's trying to steal your car or whatever. Like, what is it? I think Texas is the only place that during nighttime you can shoot somebody that's breaking into your car Jeez. at nighttime in Texas. Right. But everywhere, that's generally, you know, against the law, whether you get prosecuted or not. And, and I would advise against it even in Texas because there's right. all kinds of things that a prosecutor will be able to raise about that kind of conduct, you know. So it, it's it's just protecting properties, you know. And right. if you've not had the kind of training where this stuff is covered, you, you really need to seek that out. You know, again, to plug Andrew Branca again, he's got so much great stuff available on demand. You know, mm -hmm. look at his website. He's got full courses that you can order and watch. Yeah. He or teaches book, a lot of course every once in a while. Book. Yep. It, it, that book, if you only read one book, that would be the one to read. Absolutely. Right. The Law of Self-Defense. He, he breaks it down into the most digestible terminology for the layman, you know, because most of us are not attorneys, of course. No. And uh, it, it's the single best resource to read. So if nothing else, absolutely read that that book and you know where i start is if you do nothing else read andrew branca's book and take a stop the bleed class that's yeah. an investment of just some time you know yeah. um you can actually get or the book to it on your way to work yeah if, you don't feel, if you're not yeah. a reader you know uh, i mean those whatever. two things put you so ahead of the curve you know the stop the bleed classes are two to three hours of your time uh, a lot of you know local community firehouses will put those on etc for not even a charge you know right. so do something proactive to better prepare yourself for this this new reality yeah. that we live in know how do you know how to use all that stuff make sure you have enough inside like you know is one tourniquet enough when you have a family of four family of four or you know right just being prepared yeah absolute preparedness the vehicles and 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 the home you know have have mm -hmm. multiples of all of those essential life-saving devices and of course your firearm is it does the same thing a fire extinguisher does it's just for a different problem right yep. it's just for a That's... different threat <laughs> yep so you know all of your emergency equipment make sure that is ready to go and quickly accessible to you um certainly in the home and everywhere in public that possible that you can be armed legally certain so that's about all i have for tonight things for yeah. people to think about uh you know it's it's dreary stuff to discuss but this is the nature of our new world you know a lot of things we didn't even touch on the influx now of immigration across a wide open southern border right mm -hmm. where you know, realistically, we all realize that the vast majority of these people are just good, hardworking people, right, who are uh, seeking a better life. But among them, you know, even if it's a very small minority, we know that there's a tremendous amount of bad actors that has come into our country. So as if we didn't have enough already, now mm -hmm. that throws a whole new wrinkle into it. We see uh, new new forms of Latin American gangs setting up. So we've always had gangs like MS-13 and a few mm -hmm. others. Now, just in the past few years, we've seen new ones setting up shop. So the world is just getting inherently more dangerous than it was at least for a while. The world has always been dangerous. Let's not be naive and say, oh, you know, it's back, back in my day, you know. Right. No, back in our day, we walked around as kids just because, you know, our parents didn't know any better, right? Because mm -hmm. if uh, fun fact, you know, child abduction was actually much higher in the 80s than it is now. Yeah. Is it? And, and it makes sense. I mean, everybody now is a helicopter parent and there's cameras everywhere, right? Right. It's not that there's less pedophile sickos walking around. It's just that there's less opportunity for them, you know. But those are the things to consider. Things have always been dangerous. But as we pointed out tonight, there are new things happening that have 
given way to now a heightened threat profile. And if we need to be aware of that. We need to act accordingly. Agreed. All um, right. Speaking of training, do you have any training classes coming up? Yes, actually. Um, anybody interested can go to reflexhandgun.com, my website, and look at the schedule there. I have... Uh, I'm doing this year a class called Concealment Mechanics. It's a one full day class. It hits very heavily on drawing the gun. Such so performance shooting. We do a lot of shooting in the class, but I see a lot of deficiency, even with people who are generally good shooters, um, in, in deploying the gun. And it's not just all about speed, speed, speed. It's about being able to do it under any circumstances, in any position you find yourself, et cetera, get that gun out safely, efficiently, and quickly. So right. I'll be teaching that um, it, on May 4th in Culpeper, Virginia at FPF Training. I'll be teaching it, I want to say, in October in uh, Echo Valley Training Center in West Virginia. I'll also be teaching it at the Oak Hill Range in Yale, Virginia in, I want to say, August 29th or somewhere around the end of August. So again, anybody nice. interested in that, take a look at uh, reflexhandgun.com. And there's so much good training going on. Uh, a lot of people yeah. you and I know personally, Luke, right? We know so many of these instructors. A lot of them have full dockets going on. One that you may not have heard about is John Murphy. If John mm -hmm. Murphy is in your area, absolutely take his class, his two-day class. Um, John, it's not really a shooting class. John hits on all of the things related to criminal encroachment on the street, uh, the tactics that they use, what to look out for. He even covers, you know, the use of uh, OC spray, mm -hmm. dealing with with criminal uh, contact, et cetera. So, again, that's John Murphy of FPF Trading. Unfortunately— There's a lot out there. Yeah, there's a lot out there. But I mention him in particular because, unfortunately, the majority of, you know, gun training is very much gun training. You right. know, uh, he's, he's one of the relatively few who goes into those other very important aspects of it. But, yeah, there's there's a lot of great uh, instructors out there. And I could, you know, name a hundred that I would recommend. But I'll just give him a shout right. out for sure, just because that is a class that's few and far between classes that cover that kind of information. Yeah. So, yeah, maybe, get out and get trained, people. Maybe we'll have an episode on how to vet your instructor. That you're looking at. Um, that came, would be a came great to mind topic. of. Did you see the article I posted recently about the, the instructor in Vegas? He was given classes. He wasn't. Uh, he was no longer an instructor. So they're seeking everybody. He went to jail, or, and they're seeking everybody that uh, got permits from him to get real training. I guess so. Like, mm -hmm. How do you know your? You know, how do you vet your instructor? That so. would be an excellent uh, topic. And let's plan to cover that because, you know, it is an unregulated industry, essentially, if we can even right. call it an industry. Maybe it's big enough now to call it an industry. But it's essentially unregulated. And I I've said this before, and a lot of instructors hate me for saying it, but actual instructor certifications mean pretty much nothing. Right. <laughs> I hate to say it, you know. There's a right. lot of, I'll tell you what means a lot more. Uh, any good instructor should be able to tell you, you know, the names Please. of half a dozen, preferably a dozen or more nationally known trainers that they have trained with. Right. If nothing else, I would say that should be the absolute barometer of even considering somebody. Because if they're NRA certified or even other certifications are out there that, that mean a little bit more, even so, it means nothing. A lot of people just go and get a, an instructor certification. And if they can act safely with the gun and actually make the marksmanship test, then right. you're certified, right? And that's all it takes. And you don't learn to teach that way. You know how you learn to teach? By taking a lot of training. Right. That's how yeah. you become a good instructor. Like that person that takes the concealed carry class in the strip mall that I saw yeah. like in Vegas the other day. She's like, oh, my girlfriend's like, oh, CCW classes. Not saying There's... anything bad about it, but how does a person go from there to knowing they're, you know, going to the next class with a reputable? Reputable yeah, absolutely, you and I mean? and you know it 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 gets a little easier. So if you, once you start taking a little bit more advanced stuff like that initial CCW class, that's the kind of training the vast majority of people take, and nothing further. So it's awful hard to regulate, 
you know, the mm-hmm. thousands of instructors out there doing that kind of stuff. But certainly if you take training beyond that, that would be the number one thing I'm interested in, in is who have you trained with? That's right. what I want to know. You know, uh, preferably, do you see them in any medium? I mean, there's no excuse this day and age for an instructor not to have video out there of them teaching something. Even if it's not, you know, like on the range teaching, like, do they have videos of them showing something and teaching something? something. You know, look and see, can this person each? You know, it's, it's, it's important that the instructor is a good shooter. It's even more important that they're a good teacher, you know, and right. a lot of great shooters just, you know, can't teach at all. You know, they, they can't say things coherently and mm-hmm. instruct. They just don't know how to impart information. So, you know, look into this person's activity online. Do they have a profile? Do they have videos out there teaching you stuff? If you have a guy who's trained with, you know, uh, a dozen well-known national trainers, and he's got a bunch of videos showing all kinds of instructional stuff, he, he's probably a lot, he or she is a lot safer bet to spend your money on than, you know, some dude who hangs up a flyer in the strip. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Sign, kind of a side tangent there. I'm sure we'll go into no, that. No, but one word a bit and more. We'll do an episode on that. Yeah. And maybe we'll have an instructor too on the episode uh, to talk <laughs> about that with us too. Not that you're not an instructor, but. No, but yeah, yeah certainly. Guests the, the more, yeah, absolutely. The the more, the merrier for that. And, uh, you know, we, th- there's, there's so many good ones out there that uh, if you're in larger urban areas, a lot of them are traveling enough that. Mm-hmm. inevitably somebody will be in striking distance for you, you know, without right. too much inconvenience. Yep. So, all, all right. right. Well, I would say that's a lot of information for everybody to take in and, and ponder. And until next time, everybody stay safe. Carry your gun. Pete. Carry your gun everywhere that you can leave. We do so. Stay armed. Always be carrying your handgun. That is the day and age that we live in. No exceptions. Until next time, thank you all. Stay safe. Yep, see y'all next week.